Okay, so today we're going to be going over endocarditis. Uh, normally I like to do a few different topics when we're, um, you know, on a YouTube video, but endocarditis has so much that you need to know for the for the pants that I felt like it'd be good just to dedicate it to one video. Um, so again, really quickly, I always want to thank you so much for all the reviews, the likes on YouTube, the new subscriptions. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. And if you haven't checked out my podcast, I think it's a really good um, addition to this when you're on the go and you're driving to clinicals and things like that to help out. So if you haven't checked that out yet, um, definitely go ahead and... Um, Check that out on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with endocarditis. So what is infectious endocarditis? So this is going to be an infection of the endocardial surface of the heart, which is obviously the inner layer of tissue um, that lines the, the chambers of the heart. And usually the, the infection is going to be um, of one or more of the native heart valves. It can also be on prosthetic valves as well as intracardiac devices. Now the most um, common area the most common valve to be infected is actually going to be the mitral valve as we can see here in this diagram and what you're going to see here is these vegetations or these lesions on the valves so this infection actually lines these valves and causes a lot of different problems as we'll go over later so that's what it looks like on a, you know just an animation there again like i went over most common valve is going to be to be involved is going to be the mitral valve now there's an exception unless the patient is an iv drug user in which case the most common valve to be involved in an IV drug user is going to be the tricuspid valve. Um, and actually in 90% of patients with right-sided infectious endocarditis, of course the tricuspid valve is on the right, um, about 90% of patients with right-sided um, endocarditis are going to be IV drug users. So tricuspid valve, most common in an IV drug user. The way I always remember that, I remembered somebody saying to me, want to try drugs, like try TRI, tricuspid, Drugs, IV drug users, most common valve is the uh, tricuspid and IV drug users. So just remember the sentence, want to try drugs, and then you can think of the tricuspid valve. That's just an easy way to remember it. Um, now, risk factors. You need to be at least somewhat familiar with these so you can pick them out on a vignette and kind of, you know, point you to endocarditis. So a few different things as far as risk factors. Normally, it's going to be in older individuals, um, typically over 60. About half of all cases are patients over 60. There is a slight male to female predominance, about a 3 to 2 ratio. Um, IV drug use, obviously, like we already went over, is uh, is a factor, as a risk factor. Poor dentition or dental infection can actually cause some cases of, of an infectious endocarditis, as we'll go over later. Um, history of structural heart disease or valvular heart disease can predispose patients. And then, of course, a history of infectious endocarditis, which is pretty obvious, but it is, uh, is a risk factor, of course. And then um, presence of prosthetic heart valves. Now, the different types, um, I think you should be familiar with the different types because there's a few things, not a lot, but there's a few things that you need to know about each individual type that's going to help you um, as far as choosing treatment, as far as knowing the organisms that are going to be involved, and the presentation, things like that. So let's go over a few things I feel you need to know for each one. So let's start with acute bacterial endocarditis. Um, so these patients with acute bacterial endocarditis are generally going to have normal valves. They're not going to have any problems. They're not going to have any history of uh, valvular regurgitation, anything like that. Normal, healthy valves. Nothing wrong with the valves in most cases with acute bacterial endocarditis. Now, the most common organism is going to be a more hostile or virulent um, organism, and it has to be because it's healthy tissue that it's in infecting. It's not uh, vulnerable tissue, so it has to be pretty virulent, pretty hostile, pretty aggressive, and the most common organism in acute bacterial endocarditis is going to be Staph aureus. Group B strep is also seen, but not as common as Staph aureus, so that's going to be your most common cause in acute bacterial endocarditis. And then this is going to be a sudden onset, so it's hours to days, pretty quick onset for acute bacterial endocarditis. Now, subacute bacterial endocarditis is a little bit different than you're going to see with acute. Now, with subacute, typically the, the valves are going to be damaged heart valves, abnormal. They're going to have regurg, different things going on with these valves, but they're going to be susceptible. They're going to be vulnerable. Um, and in, because of that, the organisms are less virulent. They're less aggressive compared to the ones we see in acute bacterial endocarditis. And actually, the most common organism is uh, strep viridans. And strep viridans is actually part of your normal oral flora. Um, so in a normal patient, you can have uh, some kind of dental procedure, routine dental cleaning, it'll cause no problems. This bacteria will just be flushed out. But in a patient that has these abnormal damaged valves, can have a routine dental cleaning, they can have a tooth, tooth pulled and actually wind up with um, 
subacute bacterial endocarditis. So it doesn't need to be as aggressive. The most common organism is strep viridans. Remember that. Um, and then the onset is going to be much more indolent. It's going to be a slower, insidious onset. Sometimes it can actually take months for these patients to become symptomatic. So that's the difference between acute and subacute. So remember those things for those. And then a couple more that we want to go through. So IV drug use related endocarditis, usually no underlying valvular abnormalities. And then of course, um, or actually, Staph aureus can be your most common organism, particularly MRSA in these patients. So methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, but overall Staph aureus, most common organism. And then the most common valve to be infected, again, is the tricuspid valve. Want to try drugs, remember that. Um, and then finally, prosthetic valve endocarditis. This is going to be um, two different types. There's going to be your acute and then your late prosthetic valve endocarditis. So early is going to be um, less than 60 days from implantation or, you know, the valve repair, um, less than 60 days. And then late prosthetic valve endocarditis is going to be over 60 days from the implantation from the surgery. Now, the organisms involved in both late and early, they vary some, slightly, but generally you're going to see staph aureus, coagulase uh, negative staph. And in particular, the one that's going to be most common, um, most common generally in, a, in a early prosthetic valve, but also in late is going to be staph epidermitis. So overall, most common organism is going to be staph epidermitis. You're also going to see um, strap, a few different things, but the one you really need to know for the boards is going to be staph epidermitis in prosthetic valve endocarditis. So those are the, the different types. Now, I want you also to be familiar with the organisms. Um, so we, we briefly went over the organisms. There's a few that we didn't touch on yet, but I'm going to go over those now. And then what I want to do is give you some ways to remember all the organisms, because there's a lot. There's Staph aureus, there's Strep viridans, there's, there's a whole bunch that you need to know, and you need to know which ones, uh, which type of endocarditis they go with. So I have some ways for you to remember that. So let's go through those now. So the organisms. First, Staph aureus. Now, Staph aureus as an A, an aureus. So what does that mean? So when you see Staph aureus, think of A for acute, most common organism seen in acute endocarditis, and the other A stands for addiction. So think about drugs, addiction. Um, it's the most common organism seen in IV drug use, endocarditis. So as soon as you see Staph aureus, think of the, your two A's, acute, most common organism in acute, and addiction, most common organism in IV drug use. Now, Strep viridans, Look at that V, start thinking of things with V. So this is the most common organism in subacute infectious endocarditis, which involves these abnormal or vulnerable valves. So as soon as you see step viridans, think of vulnerable valves, and that leads you to the subacute endocarditis. Remember, the vulnerable valves have this um, less aggressive, less virulent organism, which is the strep viridans. That's that normal oral flora. So you see strep viridans, think of these vulnerable valves, and that's strep viridans. Now, staph, staph epidermitis, this one, you're going to think of the EPI, staph epidermitis, and think of it's the most common organism seen in patients with prosthetic valves. So you see the EPI and staph epidermitis, you should be thinking enters prosthetic implants. As soon as you see staph epidermitis, think enters prosthetic implants. That makes you realize that this is going to be the most common organism, organism seen in patients with prosthetic valves. Okay, moving right along. Um, this one we didn't go over in the, the different types, but there is an organism known as Enterococcus. And when you see Enterococcus, think of those first three letters, ENT. This is the most common organism seen in patients with a recent GI exam or GU exam. Now, the two exams I want you to think of, obviously it's not only these specific ones, but it helps with the mnemonic, is going to be um, an enema and terp. Enema and terp. That's your ENT, so N, like instead of AN, just N. So as soon as you see enterococcus, you should be thinking ENT, enema, which is going to be like a GI exam, N, TERP, which is a transurethral resection of the prostate, so that's going to be your GU exam. So that helps you remember it's seen with GI and GU exams, with enema as a GI exam, TERP is a GU exam. And then finally, another one is going to be strep bovis. Now, strep bovis is most commonly seen in patients with a history of colon cancer or ulcerative colitis. So colon, bovis, bowel. So bovis, B-O, bowel, B-O. So that's how you remember when you see strep bovis, think of bowel because all of the problems with the bowel, colon cancer, ulcerative colitis. So these are all the organisms and these are the types of um, endocarditis <clears throat> situations you'll see them in. So this is an easy way to remember.
I think fairly easy to at least help. I mean, this isn't easy to remember all of these different organisms and what you're going to see them in, but I think this is at least somewhat helpful. Hopefully you'll remember a few of these for the exam when you see them and it can help you differentiate on the, on the vignettes. Okay, so those are the organisms. Let's go into clinical manifestations now. Now, clinical manifestations, there's a lot of different things you'll see with um, endocarditis, and there's some that are common and some that are not very common. And a lot of the not very common things you probably never see in real life, but they still want you to know them for the boards. So let's start to go through them, and I'm also going to have a way for you to remember them as well. So overall, your most common presenting complaint, clinical manifestation, is going to be fever. That's what you're going to see in almost everybody. Keep in mind, though, um, elderly patients, immunocompromised patients may have um, an atypical presentation and not have fever. But generally, with endocarditis, you're going to see fever. That's the most common presenting complaint. Now, the other ones that are common are going to be your other constitutional symptoms. So night sweats, fatigue, myalgias, all of those are pretty common. So fever, all the constitutional symptoms are pretty common. Everything else, including murmurs, are actually pretty rare and they don't happen very frequently. But you still need to know them because you may see it in real life and it's probably going to be on the boards. So let's go over all the other things you're going to see as well. So you can pick these out in a vignette. Now, new onset of a murmur or worsening of an existing murmur. And then we got the weird stuff. So weird stuff. And, and what are the weird things? So let me go over some of the other things that you're generally not going to see in a lot of other conditions um, that are pretty, I wouldn't say specific, obviously can happen otherwise, but uh, more specific to endocarditis. So Janeway lesions, these are going to be painless. Remember that because it's important to differentiate painless macules or plaques, most commonly seen on the palms or soles. That's what that looks like there. So you can see these little lesions, little plaques that are plaques here um, <clears throat> that are going to be seen on normally the palms or the soles. It's Janeway lesions. Now there's Osler nodes, which are painful nodules that are normally found on the pads of the fingers and the toes. That's what that looks like here. You can see these little small areas there on the finger. Those are painful, and those are Osler nodes. Now, Roth spots are just going to be these pale retinal lesions, hemorrhages that are seen on fundoscopy. That's what that looks like there. Obviously, you can see all those little hemorrhages in the on the fun, uh, fundoscopic exam. And then splinter hemorrhages, which are just really nail bed hemorrhages, but they look in a certain way. So you can see these little splintering of these, uh, the hemorrhaging of the fingernails. Um, and I actually saw this on clinical rotation. We actually had a patient with this, which was really interesting because you'll probably very rarely see this in real life, but I did actually get to see it um, in one of my ER rotations. So those are some of the weird things that you'll see. Um, and then you're also going, uh, these patients may have a higher potential for emboli and anemia. Now, how are you going to remember all of these clinical manifestations? Normally, I would say don't, but because there's a really good mnemonic for it, there's a, there's a way for you to remember all of these. So the way you're going to remember um, to remember all of the different things you're going to see in um, endocarditis, you're going to remember, I got endocarditis from Jane. So this isn't my mnemonic. I will always admit if it's not mine and it's not original. So this is something I learned in PA school, but it's great. And it always helped me remember this. So I got endocarditis from Jane. From Jane stands for fever, Roth spots, Osler nodes, murmur. And then Jane stands for Janeway lesions, anemia, nail bed hemorrhages, or splinter hemorrhaging, and then emboli. So I got endocarditis from Jane. That's how you remember all of the different clinical manifestations and all the things you'll see, because you will see these on a vignette. <clears throat> or like in my case, I had it on an OSCE. I had a patient that had Osler nodes, um, they had anemia, Janeway lesions, all of these different things on my OSCE, and I had to know these things and remember that it was endocarditis. So remember, I got endocarditis from Jane, you won't forget that. Now moving on to the actual diagnosis. So the thing with the diagnosis for um, endocarditis is that it's not a simple, okay, we did an echo and uh, they have a vegetation on one of the valves, they have endocarditis. It's actually a combination of a lot of different things. So it's based upon bunch of different factors, clinical manifestations, blood cultures, echo. And anytime you have a diagnosis based upon all of these different factors, you're going to have some form of criteria. And generally what I say with criteria for the pants um, is, and for real life, of course, because you can always look these up, um, is not to memorize it. There's too much. It's a waste of time. And you normally won't have to be able to, uh, to pick these through and like count up and see if you met the criteria. So I'm going to go over it, but I would not say to memorize it. Do not waste your time. So modify do criteria. Let's go over it, obviously. Um, so to meet the criteria, it's about an 80% specificity if you do meet this criteria that they have endocarditis. Um, you need either two major, which we'll go over, 
or one major, three minor, or five minor. So you need to add those up and see if you get um, the meet the diagnosis diagnostic criteria. So let's go over the major criteria. So major criteria is going to be two separate positive blood cultures. Um, normally you're going to do it from two separate areas of the body. So you have to get a blood culture from you know two separate part of the two separate areas of the body and there's a certain amount of time in between i can't remember you won't have to know that for the boards but two separate positive blood cultures but positive for organisms that are consistent with infectious endocarditis so it can't just be any bacteria seen they have to be organisms that are consistent with um infective endocarditis so some of the ones we went over before staph aureus strep viridans any one of those um, and two separate positive blood cultures. That's one major criteria. The other one is going to be evidence of endocardial involvement confirmed by echo. So you can see vegetations um, present on echo, <clears throat> an abscess formation, new valvular regurg, any one of these things um, will you know, give you evidence that there is some kind of endocardial involvement. And if you look at an echo, you can see here, um, this is actually the, the vegetations on the mitral valve here. So these are the vegetations you can see, which is just basically the infection present that has these little lumps here on the actual valve. So that's what that looks like on echo. Um, so let's move on to the minor criteria. So minor criteria is pretty easy because a lot of the minor criteria is just all the stuff from Jane. So all the things, fever, Roth spots, Janeway lesions, etc. Each one of those is going to be a point. <clears throat> and then, <coughs> excuse me, um, some of the other minor criteria is going to be either a positive echo that doesn't meet the criteria that we want over for major or a positive blood culture that doesn't meet the criteria for major. So like the blood culture, if you have some bacteria that's not consistent with infectious endocarditis, that would be a minor finding. And the same thing with the echo, if it doesn't meet one of the criteria we went over, the, the vegetations, the new abscess, <clears throat> new um, any one of those changes we went over that was for major, something different then it would be considered a minor criteria so you can have a positive blood culture a positive echo that doesn't meet those findings and it still meets minor criteria just not major and then the other thing is going to be any predisposing factor so IV drug use indwelling catheter all these are going to be a point and remember um, as far as you know you need to add up either two major criteria one major three minor or five minor criteria to diagnose and that's um, that's the, the modified Duke criteria, and that's how you diagnose um, endocarditis. Now, on to treatment. So with treatment, it's not going to be very simple. It's, it's multidisciplinary care. You're going to have infectious disease involved, cardiology, cardiac surgeons. There's going to be a bunch of different people handling these patients. But for what you need to know for the boards, you just need to be aware of the fact that a lot of these patients are going to require some kind of surgical intervention, you know, maybe a valve replacement. But really, all you need to know otherwise is going to be the empiric antibiotic treatment. So as far as the, the empiric antibiotic therapy, I'm going to go over that in a second. But just be aware that if you have a patient that comes in, they have an acute bacterial endocarditis. They're really sick. This developed fast over a few hours, a couple of days. They're really sick. You can't wait for your blood cultures to come back to decide um, which uh, type of bacteria it is, which antibiotics it's going to be sensitive to. They're very sick. You need to treat them empirically, which means you, you give these broad spectrum antibiotics to cover a bunch of different things because you don't know what the bacteria is. Now, on the flip side, if you have a patient that has subacute bacterial endocarditis, they've been sick for months you're going to have time here. So you can get your blood cultures back, see what type of bacteria it is, see what antibiotics it's sensitive to and treat accordingly. Now on the boards, they're not going to give you a culture and say, here's the bacteria, this is what it's sensitive to, because there's your answer. So what they're going to want you to know is the empiric antibiotic therapy. So you're going to need to memorize these because you need to know when they say, okay, this patient had a, a native valve, what type of empiric antibiotic therapy you're going to know. So these are the things that you need to know. Now, for native valves, so they have their own valve, it hasn't been replaced. The antibiotics that you're going to use is an anti staphylococcal penicillin, so nafcillin, oxacillin. Use one of those combined with either ceftriaxone or gentamicin. So, two meds, you're covering your gram positive with the nafcillin and oxacillin, and then you're covering your gram negative with the um, either the gentamicin or the ceftriaxone. So, that's that, your broad spectrum coverage. So, one of these and one of these. Now, the way that I remember that is the sentence only native cardiac gears, meaning they only have native cardiac gears, like gears as in um, valves and parts, they're native. So only native cardiac gears stands for oxacillin, nafcillin, ceftriaxone, and gentamicin. So remember, you're only picking one of these and then one of these. So you can use oxacillin with ceftriaxone, 
nafcillin with gentamicin, whatever you want, just one from each to cover your gram negative and gram positive. And remember, only native cardiac gears. That reminds you, oxacillin, nafcillin, ceftriaxone, gentamicin. That's native valve. Now, if you have prosthetic valves, generally these are more complicated patients. They're likely going to need some kind of surgical repair or replacement of the valve. But as far as the antibiotics that you need to know, that's really all you need to know. It's going to be vanco, gentamicin, and rifampin. So those are the three meds that you're going to use for these patients. Sometimes the rifampin, um, they substitute that with a, um, a cephalosporin, but most of the time it's going to be rifampin. Now, um, just a side note, it's not really important for your pants, but vanco and gentamicin, the reason you use gentamicin with vanco is actually because of the synergistic effect. They actually work together much better than they do alone. So bringing them together, the vanco and the gentamicin actually improve their, their efficacy and they actually work much better, particularly against MRSA. Um, so that's why you add the gentamicin with the vanco. And then rifampin, again, you don't need to know this for your board, but I like to give you a little clinical knowledge outside of the, the board stuff. Um, rifampin, when you introduce rifampin, you don't start it for at least two to three days after starting the, the vancomycin and the gentamicin. The reason you don't is because if you treat a patient with rifampin right off the bat, um, rifampin actually has a really high rate of, um, of causing mutation in the bacteria and resistance. So with rifampin, you treat first with uh, other antibiotics like vancomycin, gentamicin, bring down the actual population of the, of the bacteria. And then once it's somewhat under control, then you can introduce rifampin and it works really well. And rifampin actually, the reason you use it in this is because it actually can penetrate the biofilm of the pathogens that infect the, the prosthetic valve. There's actually this biofilm on some of the the, uh, the organisms and rifampin can penetrate it really well. But keep in mind, again, about two to three days after you start the vanco and gentamicin. Sorry, a little bit of I got sidetracked there, but I feel like it's important for you to know once you start actually practicing what you do with these meds and why. Okay, so treatment, the way I remember that is going to be valves generally repaired, replaced, replicated, whatever you want to think of to remember that it's a prosthetic valve. It's not their original. It was repaired or replaced at some point. So I remember the sentence, valves generally repaired, that helps me remember vancomycin, gentamicin, and rifampin. Valves generally repaired or replaced, replicated, whatever R you want to use here to remember that the valves are not their own. They've been replaced or replicated, whatever. So that's the sentence I remember for prosthetic valve impaired treatment. And then fungal, really, really easy. Um, fungal infection is just going to be amphotericin B for about six to eight weeks. And with the native valve and the prosthetic valve treatment, the antibiotics, they're typically going to be for about four to six weeks you're going to treat. Um, as far as the empiric antibiotic therapy. So that's your treatment. That's really all you need to know. Um, there is one more thing that you need to be familiar with, and that's the antibiotic prophylaxis. Now, antibiotic prophylaxis with endocarditis, you're not going to use in every patient. You're really only going to use in patients where you feel like there's um, a, a, a patient that has a high likelihood of some kind of adverse outcome if they did wind up getting endocarditis. So there's certain patients that are going to be more predisposed and in patients with a history of, let's go over that now. And again, do not memorize this. This is not something you need to memorize. Be somewhat familiar with it. Hear it as I'm talking to you about it. Maybe read it once, but don't memorize it. There's just way too much and it's not worth it. It's not high yield. But um, if a patient does have a history of infectious endocarditis, they have an unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, uh, heart repairs using prosthetic material, not including stents repaired congenital heart dis disease or defects with the residual shunts, prosthetic patches or devices, valvular regurg due to structurally abnormal valve in a transplanted heart. Those are all the patients. And again, it's ridiculous to, to try to memorize that. Um, but anytime you see like a patient that has some kind of congenital heart disease, they have some valvular regurg, some kind of problem with a heart, you may want to start thinking, okay, maybe this patient needs to be prophylaxed for endocarditis. Now the procedures you're going to prophylax for are going to be dental procedures, um, if there's any type of manipulation, perforation of the gingival tissue. Um, so if they have like a really aggressive cleaning, you may need to actually use prophylaxis. Um, if they have a tooth pulled, a dental abscess, anything like that, where there's any manipulation of the gingival tissue, you want to go ahead and use prophylaxis. Um, if they have a respiratory tract procedure, but only procedures involving an incision or a biopsy. So say they have a bronchoscopy, but no biopsy, you don't need to use prophylaxis. But if they have a bronchoscopy and they have a biopsy, then you need to use antibiotics prophylax. And then finally, any skin or soft tissue procedures of infected skin. 
anytime you're manipulating the skin or the soft tissue, you want to have um, prophylaxis. So again, be familiar with these, but do not memorize it. This is an absolute waste of time um, for something that's very low yield. The one thing you should memorize is the actual antibiotics you need to use. And really, there's only a couple. Um, the main antibiotic that you want to use for prophylaxis and um, endocarditis is going to be amoxicillin. Two grams, 30 to 60 minutes prior to the procedure. That's the preferred antibiotic. The only reason you're not going to use amoxicillin is if they have uh, penicillin allergy, in which case you would use clindamycin, um, 600 milligrams, just if they have a penicillin allergy. So memorize the amoxicillin, the clindamycin if you need to without the allergy, but don't remember all the other stuff. It's a waste of time. Okay, so that is endocarditis. Um, I try to get through the stuff pretty quickly, only stick to the high yield stuff, and hopefully that was helpful. Let's do five quick questions just to see how much you've retained of what I went over. Um, so what is the most common valve involved in a patient who is an IV drug user? Hopefully you remember this because you want to think of, do you want to try drugs? Try cuspid valve, so that's the most common valve in a patient who's an IV drug user. You want to try drugs, try cuspid valve. Um, what is the most common organism seen in subacute endocarditis, which remember infects those damaged or vulnerable valves? Vulnerable valves, most common organism, strep viridans. That's going to be most common. Remember the V, viridans, vulnerable valves. Um, what are Roth spots? Roth spots are retinal hemorrhages or lesions seen on fundoscopy. You can also remember Roth spots starts with an R, retina starts with an R, it might help you. Um, what is the empiric treatment regimen for a patient with a prosthetic valve endocarditis? So prosthetic valve endocarditis, hopefully you remember the mnemonic, vancomycin, gentamicin, rifampin, and that was going to be the, the treatment regimen that you're going to use. So what is the most common clinical manifestation seen in patients with endocarditis? So most common clinical manifestation seen in patients with endocarditis is going to be a fever. So that's your most common clinical manifestation. Okay, so thank you so much um, for listening to the, the video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you again for all the reviews. It really does make my day when I see those. Um, I'm so happy to see that it, it, that is helping you guys. Um, so thank you again, and good luck in uh, PA school. Good luck on your pants, your pantry, and your EORs.